Cavalcade of America. Starring Gene Arthur in Journey Among the Lost. Presented by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Time, 108 years ago this month. Place, a jail in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Twenty women in the jail, but only three are singing. Mary murdered her husband. Elizabeth was arrested for arson. Clara is the pickpocket. They don't especially like that hymn, but they do like the soft-voiced lady in sober cashmere, the lady who had come to the East Cambridge prison, Dorothea Lind Dick. Oh, that's very nice, ladies. Thank you. We'll try it again next week. Turnkey, count them good and lock them up again. All right, go on back to yourself. Oh, uh, it beats me, Miss Dix. You got them singing hymns. That sure beats me. I'll come again next Sunday, Taylor. We're glad to have you, ma'am. Oh, not that door. Oh, excuse me. I thought this was the way out. <laughs> not that door. That leads to the loony hatch. What did you say? Say, that door leads to the loony hatch. Got three crazy people in there. Follow me, ma'am. I'll show you. Something wrong, ma'am? Why are they kept in prison? Well, prison or the poorhouse, ma'am. Only place for a loony. Follow me, please. Jailer, may I be permitted to see them? What for? I'd like to see all the women in the prison. What for? Because you don't want me to see them. They're none of your business. That door stays shut. You know, Jailer, there's something about a closed door. Now, you're a busy lady, Miss Dix. Better go about your business. I want to see the women behind that closed door. Now, ma'am, you listen and to me. And you listen to me. I read a line from the Bible to some thieves and murderers. I'm going to read a line from the Bible to some poor, crazy women. Well, why do you want to read the Bible to loonies? Because it's Sunday. Now, you stop arguing and open that door. Ma'am, I'll say it for your own good. That room is no place for a lady. Open that door. All right. Suit yourself. You asked for it. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> well, like I said, you asked for it. But they can't hurt you. We've got them safe and secure. Now, the one in the cage on the left is Minnie. Minnie, wake up. Here's a lady to say something to you. What can she say that I haven't already heard? Oh, you, you poor woman. You're cold. I am cold. You have something else to say? Is there no stove here? Nay, there's no stove here. What else have you to say? Keep a civil tongue, Minnie. The lady is from Boston. She comes on this Sunday to read a line of scripture. I already know a line of scripture. Oh, Minnie. Minnie, why are you here? I'm crazy. Oh, no. You mean you're sick. What difference? I'm here, ma'am. Is there something else you'd like to ask of me? If not, I want to go back to sleep. Stella, Stella, take me out. I want to go out. Well, I warned you what you could expect. Why from... are those women kept in cages? I was saying that you can't expect Why is there much... no stove in that room? A stove with fire in it ain't safe where there are raving maniacs. I saw Minnie. She's nothing like that. She's sick and she's cold. Now, you're taking on, ma'am. She's a loony and everyone knows that loonies don't feel the cold. What? Who told you that? 
Now, that'll do, ma'am. You came to teach a Bible class, not to run this prison. Now, stay with the Bible. I am, Jailer. Where is your God? You're taking on, ma'am. You're taking on. I'll show you out. Hmm? I asked you a question. Don't dismiss me. This way, if you please, I'll show you out. Those women are fringing. This way, please. I'm not asking for myself. Well, I don't answer for myself. I'm not in charge. I do what I'm told. Now, this way, please. Put a stove in there. Treat them the way you treat a dog. You don't have to treat them any better. Only as well. You're carrying on, ma'am. Now, this way, please. I'm dismissed, then? Yes, ma'am. You're dismissed. Your Honor, I... I haven't slept these, these last ten days. And I would say, Miss Dix, you ought to go home and go to bed. That's a contemptible remark. Careful, ma'am. You're in a court of law. Maybe I'm in the wrong place. I'm looking for a court of justice. Miss Dix, I'm going to say it just as simply as I can. There is nothing this court can do. See the superintendent of the prison. I've seen him, Your Honor. He says there's nothing he can do. Well, then take it up with the town council. They say there's nothing they can do. Go see the mayor. I've seen the gentleman. He says East Cambridge treats its lunatics no worse than some and better than most. Well, then that's your answer. Now, if you don't mind, this court will adjourn. Good. Good. I'll go back to the prison and tell three crazy women that their lives have been adjourned. Hmm? What did you say? There are three women in that prison who will surely die unless this court intervenes. Oh, please, please, let, let's not be emotional. I'm talking about a fact. I've seen three women with my own eyes here in civilized Massachusetts. They're going to freeze to death because no one cares that much. Well, Miss Dix, my hands are tied. This is a court of law. A court of law is a place of justice. This court cannot ignore the distress of people simply because they're devoid of reason. Your Honor, why must innocent persons be housed with criminals? Well, I And since don't... they are imprisoned, why are they not entitled to the same consideration as swindlers and murderers? I can't answer you, Miss Dix. The question has never been put to me. Then I put it to you. All right, all right. I'll tell me what I can do. Issue an order, sir, directing that a stove for heat and warm clothing be furnished. I'll do whatever I can, madam. Then do it now. Issue an order now and let me serve it on the jailer today. Very well, Miss Dix. I'll do it now. <laughs> Minnie. Minnie, is that you laughing? I, I do laugh. Because of the new stove, Minnie, and the shawl around your shoulders? Nay. I laugh because I'm melancholy. The walls are not, not so damp now with the new stove. Well, the walls as dry as my eyes after crying. I would still be melancholy in this place. Will you tell me? You, you've been gentle with me. They say I'm crazy. I lost my baby in childbirth. Now I'm here. Sometimes the darkness passes and I would be alive. Mrs. Ellis in the next cage begins to scream. Minnie, Minnie, I will get you out of here. What's the good? You'll be out of prison. Send me to the poor farm. I'd sooner it were prison. Here at least there's food to eat. Minnie, there are doctors. They will make you well. <laughs> and the melancholy will pass? Yes, yes, it will pass. If you struggle to make it pass, Minnie, let me help you. I... Why do you do it for me? My name could be Minnie. There are hundreds like me in Massachusetts. Better go away. You'll have no rest. Would you go away? Mm -hmm. Me? No, I, I've been here. I am here. I, I wouldn't go away. But then, I'm crazy. Then I pray God to make me crazy. Why do you come to me, Dorothy? You should have gone to Dr. Channing or Horace Mann or Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe. Why do you come to me? Do you really want to know, Charles? Yes, I think I do. Because you're a lawyer and a practical man. Oh. Uh, no other reason? Yes. I came to you because you're my friend. 
Well, now, that's a little better. <laughs> you know, Dorothy, uh, <laughs> when you laugh, you... Yes. No, nothing. Only you ought to laugh more often. <clears throat> yes, but you forget, Charles. I've been to Cambridge Prison. I saw a woman chained. But try not to think of her. She was kept in a cage, like an animal. Dorothy, you don't have the strength to do anything about it. Who says so? All right. Tell me what you propose. I shall visit every insane man and woman in every prison in Massachusetts. In every prison? Yes, Charles, and in every poorhouse. My dear, look, I'm your practical lawyer. What you propose is impossible. Now, why don't we organize the best citizens of Boston into a committee? We'll distribute a questionnaire. I have no faith in committees and less faith in questionnaires. I want to do it myself. Well, where will you get the money for your survey? My own money, my own energy, my own time. Then what do you want from me? Charles, maybe I have a New England conscience, but that doesn't make me a fool. I'm going to get into trouble. I'm going to need help. I'll help. Horace Mann, Channing, Howe, we'll all help. But we're not enough. You'll need much more. I've got it. You have? My right as an American to protest injustice. If I'm allowed to gather the facts and bring the facts to the legislature, the legislature must do what's right. You know, Dorothea, the legislature is going to be fooled by a pair of soft gray eyes and a sweet face. May the Lord have mercy on them. Now, is there anything else? Yes, a small thing. Yes, of course. I have some money and some clothes. They're for Minnie. She's been released, will you? Yes, yes, she'll be helped. You know, I think in the fourth chapter of the book of Esther, there's a line... And Mordecai said to Esther, Who knoweth, perhaps thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I'm not quite sure of the words, Dorothy Dix, but I am sure that Mordecai meant you. Listening to Journey Among the Lost, starring Jean Arthur as Dorothy Lynn Dix on the Cavalcade of America. Presented by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. In the year 1841, a woman named Dorothea Lynn Dix visited a jail in East Cambridge, Massachusetts, and saw confined there the insane. This was the beginning of her journey among the lost. She went to all the prisons and poorhouses of Massachusetts, and each day's visitation brought each day's horror. Tell me, tell me your name. My name... Yes, what's your name? My name. Doesn't she understand? Of course not, Miss Dick. She's an idiot. I told you. My name. That'll do, Mariah. That'll do. My name. When was she last seen by a physician? What sort of foolishness is that? When was she last seen by a physician? She's never been seen by a physician. My name. Why do you keep her in chains? So that she can't hurt herself. Now, look, I can't stand here answering foolish questions. I've got other things to do. How long has she been in these chains and in this place? There are some questions better be left unasked. How long has she been chained here? You really want to know? Yes. Seventeen years this Christmas. You're strong, Miss Dix. I told it to my wife. She fainted. I do not faint, sir. Not anymore. Not after the things I've seen. Not after where I've been. Where have you been, ma'am? I have been in hell... Help you with your bag, lady? Thank you. I wonder if you could tell me where the county home is. Going to see a relative, eh? Too bad. What do you mean, sir? Why is it too bad? Well, the home is uh, just the other side of the railroad bridge, but uh, no one there today except a few old folks too weak for the auction. I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, you see, twice a year, the county poor board auction off the insane folks and orphans. 
When was the auction? Two o'clock yesterday. Saves the county quite a bit of money and keeps the insane and the orphan out of mischief. Got off the train for nothing, lady. Too late to see your relative, I guess. Oh, Miss Dix, I wouldn't like you to go away from here thinking we're heartless people. You keep a woman locked in a cellar. Yep, that's right. There's another woman we didn't dare show you. We keep her locked in a closet. Now, Miss Dix, suppose you was responsible for that home, not me. And suppose, just suppose it was you and not me that had to care for 50 orphans and insane people on $2,000 a year. Food, clothing, doctors, everything, you see. And on $2,000 a year. And you didn't have it. I wasn't judging you. I've stopped judging anyone. Well, you do what you can, Miss Dix. If you've got someone hard to handle, you you just lock her in a closet. I know it, Mr. Saunders. You don't have to explain to me. We're human people just like you are, Miss Dix. Trouble is, when you're around suffering so much, you get used to it. And I guess when you get used to something, maybe you don't care so much. I'm glad you spoke to me, Mr. Saunders. It's something I'd like to tell the Massachusetts legislature. Uh, Miss Dix, now we've got a poor crazy woman... All day long, the tears run down her face, and she says, My kinfolk, she says to me, My, my kinfolk has failed me, and my own familiar friend has forgotten me. Miss Dix, maybe someone ought to tell that to the Massachusetts legislature. <laughs> Madam, this committee of the legislature has listened very carefully, but I fail to see why you are here. In the first place, are you here for yourself, the people of Massachusetts, or, Madam, whom do you represent? I am the advocate of the insane. You are indeed. And what do the insane ask of this committee? Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, take the insane and the mentally sick out of the prisons and poorhouses. Where shall we put them? In hospitals, in asylums. What for, madam? So they can be helped instead of punished. Madam, have you any idea of the cost involved? It will be a considerable sum, Mr. Chairman. And who will pay, madam? I believe that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will do anything that can be shown to be right. A very pretty speech, madam, but hospitals and asylums are an expense which, once begun, will increase and increase. We have to think of the cost. Think of the cost of broken minds. The minds of men and women who are only sick, whom you condemn to permanent and hopeless lunacy. I beg your pardon, madam. I am not aware that I have made anyone a lunatic. <laughs> are you looking for someone, Miss Dix? No. But I observe that the committee member from Eastboro is laughing. Yeah, well, now, don't you say anything about Eastboro. Three blocks from your house, sir, in Eastboro. There's a man being held in a cellar half filled with water. That's a filthy lie. His name is Jones, age 53. He's been in that cellar since last July. He's changed. Mr. Chairman, I won't have anyone come here and tell a foul lie about the fair city of Eastboro. The address is number three, White Hugh Lane. Be careful of the rat. Miss Dix, are you trying to provoke this committee? No, Mr. Chairman. I'm trying to present facts. Eighteen months of carefully gathered facts. Gathered by whom? Me, myself. Boston ladies, I know, do not customarily travel by themselves. You're changing the subject. Nor do they make a practice of reporting things which no lady should know and of which no gentleman should speak. Right. The pictures you draw for us, madam, are coarse and uncouth. Would you like something a little more refined? I would indeed. I cannot oblige. Mr. Sumner is holding my report. 300 pages of documented misery. You can't sprinkle it with perfume. There's a dreadful stench that comes from it. Mr. Chairman, you think I exaggerate? Come with me. Where? To your own city. For what purpose? To determine whether I am a liar or you are heartless. I resent the insinuation. That you are heartless, I'm glad to hear it. Perhaps you're merely ignorant. My dear Miss Dix. Tell me I'm not polite. I'm no diplomat. Mr. Chairman, do I have to be? I don't want any favors for myself. I'm an American, speaking to Americans. This is your state. The people described in my report are your neighbors. 
They have no one to plead their cause except me. And no one to listen except you. How are you going to answer? She had spoken unpleasant truth. Now there was time for grievances to foster. I dislike women who have no sense of the propriety of our sex. A Gazette published an editorial. On the whole, the public will be quite liberal if they discounted 50% of everything Dorothy had just claimed as fact. Another newspaper spoke more plainly. The woman is obviously a congenital liar. She had done all she could. Now Charles Sumner, Dr. Howe, and Horace Mann went to do battle with the legislature. And while she waited to hear the outcome, a woman dressed in plain black came to her door, entered her house, said very simply, You can't lose. What did you say? I said you can't lose. I can't lose. Minnie. Yes. Oh, Minnie, let me look at you. <laughs> I'm a seamstress now. I, I'm well. You made me well. No, Minnie, it was the doctor. It was you, Miss Dix. Oh, the doctor gave me medicine, but you gave me yourself. I had to come to tell you that you couldn't lose. Oh, Minnie, how do you know that? Well, you talked to them, didn't you? Yes, but... They listened to you, didn't they? They've delayed action on the bill. They may not even vote today. If they listen to you, they'll vote. If they heard you, all their pleasures will turn sour until they do what's right. You'll see. Goodbye, ma'am. The Massachusetts legislature considered a bill to remove the indigent insane and the mentally sick from public almshouses and prisons and install them in public hospitals. Asylums. The first public asylums in America. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. no. Mr. Speaker, call the roll. Mr. Dressler? Aye. Mr. Gordon? Aye. Gordon? Aye. They tabulated the votes. When the totals were read, Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe and a man named Charles Sumner came to her and said, Dorothy, you've won. The bill has been carried. This victory could have been enough. Yet for Dorothy Lynn Dix, it was the beginning of her life's work, for she was an American. Massachusetts was only one state in a great nation. She went from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. Can't promise, ma'am, but we're calling a special session. She presented the facts, the hard facts. Yes, dear. Five solid months of traveling, at least today. Try to rest. She went into the dark valleys of the world, into the strange, melancholy society where the desolate are gathered and the unconsoled. Take off those chains. He's not a criminal. He's sick. She couldn't stop. And wherever she went, the hospitals arose. She had seen an evil and pioneered to drive it from our country. She did her best to transform the treatment of the mentally sick and help change the old institutions from places of doom where people came only to die into houses of hope. One of the monuments to her memory is the New Jersey State Hospital at Trenton, which she founded where she died on July 17, 1887. A whole world mourned her. They opened a book over her grave, and we like to think that it might have been a woman named Minnie who read the word. I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Gene Arthur and cast, for your fine performances. Tonight's cavalcade play, Journey Among the Lost, was written by Morton Wishengrad. Music was composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Bryan. This week, the Girl Scouts celebrate their 37th anniversary, and we of Cavalcade hope you will join us in paying tribute to this fine American group which unites girls of all backgrounds and faiths for the welfare of our nation. This is Ted Pearson speaking. Next week, Cavalcade will present a moving radio play, My Hunt After the Captain. It's the story of Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes' search on the battlefield and in the hospitals of the Civil War for his wounded son. Our stars will be the celebrated stage and screen personalities, Conrad Nagel and William Ice. Cavalcade of America is directed by John Zoller and comes to you each week from the stage of the Long Acre Theater on Broadway in New York and is presented by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.